and welcome to Nerd Talk. I'm Pixie. I'm Sim. And I'm Pyro Sim. Ta da! <laughs> That's it, show's over, go home. No. <laughs> this is a show with, on it. We are going to review things such as Underworld Awakening, which is not Underworld Evolution, despite Jeff's confusion on the subject. <laughs> We are yeah. also going to talk about school stuff, because we're all in school now, and we're going to talk about being good at school. Anybody else have anything? Hi, folks. I'm having trouble here in Pyro, so a bit of technical difficulties. We'll work on that. This is the symptom of preparing for the show five minutes before the show. So yeah, go ahead and keep talking. All right, I'll all right. dive right into Underworld Awakening. This is the fourth installment of the vampire series that has Kate Beckinsale in it, even though the third movie did not have Kate Beckinsale in it, and that makes me wonder how it's possible for that movie to exist. But my experience with this series is that I'm pretty sure I've seen all of the movies, but prior to going into number four, I did not have any memories of the previous three movies whatsoever. Yeah, I'm too. And movie so unforgettable that it's apparently making me cough. The other thing Forget about it. Underworld Awakening is that I was not expecting what I got when I went into that movie. I, I think I probably would have enjoyed it more if I had known what it was going to be before I went into it. And what it is is incredibly violent and loud. And violent and loud. And <laughs> this description is reminding me of else? Yeah, this is reminding me of uh, Terminator Salvation where it's just like, we don't have quality, so we're just going to turn up the volume and people will think it's cool. That said, I actually liked the movie a lot. I I, I wasn't quite expecting that, but once I figured out that that's what the movie was and it wasn't hard Violence to figure it out because it was right there in your face. I was like, okay, well, I guess I'm just going to sit back and enjoy the mega violence. And the mega violence was really good looking. At one point, there was a character who ripped out another character's throat. And you can look into the part where their throat is missing and count out. That's the trachea. That's the esophagus. That's the jugular. That's the sp There's all the parts. And they're all easily identifiable. There's lots of... Very accurate gore in this movie. You, you have to think that that is actually someone's day job to sit in a room and look at a diagram of the inside of someone's throat out of, like, the Grey's Anatomy book and go, now how can we render that? Yep. What kind of damage would this do if someone put a claw right through that person's throat and pulled? So, I'm sure nobody will be surprised to hear that the plot is passable but not interesting, not anything to write home about. Wait, but, this is an Underworld movie and we're talking about plot? I can't help but talk about I, plot. I, I, I'm plot sorry, I thought, I thought the point of this franchise was to see Kate Beckinsale in skin-tight leather. That's the other thing, is there was some of that, but that actually was not as important to the movie as I thought it would be. Really? Because that was like the entire plot of Underworld 2. <laughs> it's... She's still wearing very tight, shiny leather for the entire movie. And indeed, she is stripped of it. Okay, the very beginning, she gets captured and taken to this laboratory. And so she's in this cryogenic freezing tube, naked, obviously. And then somebody rescues her, and she falls out, and there's fog on the ground. And I am once again annoyed by the lack of nudity in R-rated movies. When the movies that are really taking it to the limit of what an R-rated movie can be, yet they still shy away from nudity. But, okay, so she's covered up by fog, and then she's like, Well, I don't know where I am, or what happened to me, or what's going on in any way. And so she looks around the room, and then she's like, sees her cat suit, and she's like, Well, I know what to do here. And then, cat suit. And so that's... Pretty much the only scene in the movie without the leather in it for a brief period of time. It's all about the leather. But what, what the movie is actually all about is the visuals. 
and the visuals extend beyond just the leather. It's actually the plot as it exists and even the violence and everything else only serve to put some really cool looking pictures on screen. That's what you're here for. In the same way that, you know, Final Fantasy VII is mostly justified by its music, and and I, it's worth I playing that game. I thought Final Fantasy VII was just justified by Sephiroth loving fan service. That, that was the actually, entire game. That's all external to the game, because the game is so polygonal. There's not any room I, for fan service in Final Fantasy VII. It, it is true. That character had almost no screen time and somehow spawned a massive following. I don't and quite And to get the extent that. that he did have screen time, he had no detail. He was made out of 10 to 15 polygons. Right. Apart from the, like, cutscenes. Interesting see. fact to note is the reason that Final Fantasy VII looks the way that it does is because they were originally developing it for the N64 before they decided, oh, shit, we're going to do it for the PlayStation all of a sudden. Well, when you get into a massive fight with the people who actually own the console, you're going to want to change what you're working on. Yep. And so, that is how Sony made most of its money, by that switchover. Anyways, Underworld is Underworld Awakening is all about pretty pictures, and there are some very pretty pictures in it. There's, like, a hydroelectric dam that features prominently, and so there's a couple of scenes that they're characters are standing on this walkway and there's this giant waterfall that's really cool and there's just it's all about the images and there's some good images which is why i have to say for the love of god don't see this movie in 3d i mean don't see any movie in 3d but this particular movie although it was actually shot in 3d with stereoscopic cameras is utterly destroyed by 3D. And Seriously, stop encouraging them to make 3D movies. The, the reason that 3D destroys this movie is because all of the sharp lines that are the characteristic visual style of the series become blurry. And it's like, ah, this sure would look great if it wasn't so blurry, but it's really kind of pretty blurry. And So much blur. So I saw this in 3D. I didn't want to, but the showtimes of the theaters conspired such that I was not able to go to a 2D showing. And that annoys me particularly when I don't believe in movie theaters much anyway in the age of digital distribution. I'm, yeah. I'm especially jaded on having having to go to a showing of kind of the wrong movie, even though I could be watching it at any time at my house and not have to wait for the specific time and drive across town. But, yeah. Underworld Awakening looks great. Um, I'm sure it would look much, much better in 2D. Um, no particular music to speak of. Um, lots of cool fighting. Lots of gore. Lots of body horror. It's not a scary movie, but it is something like a scary movie. There's... There is a scene with a needle and an eyeball, which tips you off a little bit, but there aren't any jump scares. It's it's a it's a scary movie that caters to my particular taste. There's no psychological horror and there's no jump scares. It's so just we're, we're talking very it's kind violent. of like the the Resident Evil films, except with more of a plot because you can't have less of a plot than those movies. Um, Actually. Damn near identical to the third Resident Evil movie. Which I actually liked a lot, and I know I'll take some heat for that, but... I, Except I thought that, that those a... movies just seem to be excuses for getting Milia Jovovich half-dressed and or in fetish gear. And these are movies for getting Kate Beckinsale half-dressed and in fetish gear. And there's lots so... of... It worked both times, as far as I'm concerned. You, you know, at least I'll say that vampires and werewolves make far better villains than several hundred zombies, and a poorly acted version of Wesker. Yeah, there's... I, I'm gonna go ahead and give away the final fight, because nobody cares. Spoiler! 
Wars. Yeah, no, I, I've heard this one, and it's actually got me like on the borderline edge where I might want to go see this. It's it's pretty cool. There's there's this main antagonist who's they've been fighting with for the entire movie, who's an especially powerful variant of werewolf, in that his healing factor is cranked up to eleven. He's like Wolverine from the X Men. He's just practically invincible, even against Silver, and so that. It had happened previously in the movie where uh, Kate Beckinsale had stuck her hand inside somebody's torso and grabbed their heart, and the camera had gone inside the, their ventral cavity to look at her hand grabbing his heart. That, that, that was a different character, but there's a callback to that where they're fighting, and she's like, knife hand uh, under your ribs to stick my hand into your ventral cavity. Except this time, she had a grenade. And so she left the grenade there with the pin out and pulled her hand back, and then the wound healed. And so he's like, holy shit, I've got a grenade inside of me. And he's like, must get the grenade out, but he already healed. And then he Regenerate explodes. that. Boom. All right, then. It was pretty cool. Uh, yeah. The other thing that I wanted to say is that I went into this movie expecting Cheesecake to be you know, a, a major focus of the movie, but it really wasn't. It was it was very incidental to the rest of the visuals. Yeah, uh, no, yes. oddly enough, the, the Underworld franchise actually seems to understand that we need to make an actual movie that, that people want to see. There was... Kate Beckinsale was in the really tight, shiny leather the whole time, but the camera didn't pay attention to it. It, it just happened to be that she was wearing that. The camera yeah. didn't, like, well, sit on her butt for five minutes or well, anything. Well, that's kind of like the established attire of this character. Yeah. Versus it, the, the Milia Jovovich character in Resident Evil, where it's just kind of, what outfit are we putting her in today? Yes. And the other thing is that the catsuit is appropriate to the rest of the very gothic visuals that are incorporated throughout every other aspect of the movie, to the architecture and the buildings to what everybody else is wearing and the weapons they're using. Yeah. We've already covered that the action scenes seem to be well done with the special effects. How's the actual acting overall? Um... Very good, actually. Um, there's... The screenplay is, of course, neither good nor bad, and the acting does not take that screenplay and make of it something it isn't, but the acting is all very good for the screenplay. There's a couple of pretty compelling characters. Um, side characters who are new characters, actually. I don't know if the main characters are quite as interesting as a human detective dude. Okay, definitely the best actor in this movie is a human detective dude who's a uh, wife got turned and then secretly executed by the government a while back. And so he's sort of bitter about the government vampire extermination program. And so Celine is like, I'm going to go kill the bad guys who are involved in the government vampire extermination program. And he's like, well, I'm a cop and I'm supposed to be investigating these murders that might have been caused by supernatural creatures. But I'm going to help you with this. And he's actually a hilarious and well-acted character. Kind of interesting and deep. As right. much as I like Kate Beckinsale, I don't know that her acting is quite as special as his. But all of it is good. Alright. Sure, special. That's the word we'll go with. Yeah. Hey, the, the, the detective's acting is really good. It's hilarious. I, I hate to keep bringing it up, but this feels like the Resident Evil that tries. Well, the did any of the Resident Evil movies have comedy in them? Because this is... They, like, they, tr they tried very poorly, to Like, any comedy that was in those movies was entirely accidental and just caused by either bad acting or bad special effects. That, that's the best I can say. Ah, now I've remembered something very important that I wanted to say. Um, the screenplay has uh, thriller movie fundamentals, which is to say that the main characters are screwing up and getting in worse and worse situations all the time. And so things are really bad before they win. It's like 
they have to earn their victory because they they fucked up and been screwed over many times before they actually win. What did you do? Well, I swallowed a live grenade. Yep, yeah, that actually so almost happens time. to Kate Beckinsale's character. She has a grenade blow up right in her face. An ultraviolet light grenade that vampires are allergic to. Wouldn't that just dust most vampires instantly? Oh, uh, yes, although actually the main character is special. Main character. And the main character is special because she's immune to light. And she was granted that gift by the vampire elders earlier in the series. Right. Super special snowflake. She, she's a day pyre. She, yep. She's a, uh, you know, Mary Sue. Oh, but... there's no question that that's how this character is written. <laughs> Really, if anyone's wondering about that, just just look at the main character and think, yeah, no, she's completely average. Nothing special about that whatsoever. The detective is really, really funny and a, a balance against the ultraviolence of most of the movie. That's the other thing that it's good at, is that while the screenplay isn't special, it actually knows that you can't do one thing all the time and have it stick. So it, it kind of there is a little bit of comedy relief that makes the final battle more impactful. And that's an indicator that the writers know what they're doing. And it makes the movie much better than it would be otherwise. Uh, final comment is that the main character has these little pistols that shoot like automatic machine guns. So she's putting like 50 rounds a second out of these handheld like Walther PP7s. And I'm like... Well, that is super awesome. Where is she storing all the ammo? Because these guns are tidy. And she's like, 5,000 bullets in one minute. But yeah, it's cool. So, I guess it gets a pass on that regard. Alright then. I guess. So yeah, Underworld... Which, which one was it? Underworld... Awakening, number Awakening. four. You, you I keep, th I keep like thinking Evolution when that was the previous one. Yep. Um, that was number two. Number three was Rise oh. of the Lycans. This is number four. Oh, yeah, that's right. Number three was a prequel, wasn't it? Number three was a prequel, and it didn't have Kate Beckinsale in it. it but apparently she was willing to come back for the fourth one. Yeah, I guess so. <laughs> As opposed to Ilya Jovovich, who's just like, yeah, you're signed on for this one, right? There was any question? <laughs> right. Not doing anything else. But the only reason I'm actually doing these movies is just to bone the director, really. I think they're... Did they split I, yeah, I think they're divorced. Something? Really? I missed that. Yeah. Numerical sure scores, we can look up which I do, gossip. despite not liking the idea of numerical scores, I'd say 7.5 out of 10. It's a good movie. Alright then. Worth your dollars. So, I guess we should move on to the main meat of our show for today, besides our review. We are going to be discussing the upcoming releases for 2012, because that's a thing we like to do. Ooh, oh, there's wait, releases. What? Wait, what? I didn't know about this either, but I'm no, going to play along. No, wait. I have figured your main meat of the show was going to be the lead news. I thought we'd like to save that to the end, because that at least keeps a couple of our listeners until the very last minute. The ones who are obsessed with League of Legends. Okay. New releases this year. Obviously, Mass Effect 3. The one yeah. that I'm waiting for. Well, we're going to go on a month-by-month -month thing, because we've got yep. a wiki up. We, we've got it by months. Uh, these are only covering the major releases, so if there's a specific indie game that you're super thrilled about, go ahead and say it in chat. We'd love to hear about it, or send us a link after the show. Um, if you want to see it reviewed, go ahead and let us know. Uh, that said, uh, Cosmic Wiener Dog, I promise you Charles Barkley, Shut Up and Jam Gaiden, is going to get played. This year. We're, we're going to get around to it. At some point in It will happen. I, I understand we, we do have the worst customer service ever, whether it's for, for my handling of prize support or for our handling of review requests, but it will get done. I promise. I actually started it the other day. It is so, in the works. It's in progress, so we might actually see it. <gasps> this year. In, in 2012. It will be done. Okay. No promises when, but it will be done. So we are going to cover this by month by month. Again, if there's something you really want to see us reviewed, uh, something that you think we should be looking at, let us know. Hit us up on Facebook, let us know through the website, or you can use our dusty, dusty forums. Anyway, so moving 
moving on, do we really have anything for January? I have three things in January I'm actually interested in. Uh, the month's already almost over, but we've actually got one more solid Tuesday that actually has three big releases. Okay. So first up, we have Square Enix's Apology to the World, which would be Final Fantasy XIII-2, supposedly actually a game this time, instead of just a movie that you occasionally walk down a hallway for. Actually, more like an endless series of hallways punctuated by intermittent movie. <laughs> yeah. Um, so this time it actually looks like it's shaping up to be a game with a story and characters that you can kind of connect with, as opposed to the last one where the only character anyone could connect with was, uh, Zaz. You know, the guy who had a baby chocobo living in his hair. I connected with him because he had my same hair. <laughs> You have small birds living in yours. Nobody would. <laughs> At some point, maybe, it might have happened. So yeah, this actually looks like a true game instead of... Well, what everyone was joking this was going to be is it, it's going to be 13 with a dress sphere system. Because who doesn't like dressing up their characters like shiny little dollies? I can't say I don't. I loved the heck out of Saints Row the Third, and I may have done a lot of dressing up in that game. I dressed my character like a psychotic pimp and left him that way. Anyway. Anyway. Oh my god. Next up, Never Dead. So I, I need to pull up the actual article for this one, because it, it's unique. Um, it's from Re uh, Rebellion Development, being published by Konami. Um, basically, the idea of Never Dead is you have a character who is cursed to be immortal, but that doesn't stop him from being blown to pieces. So during this game, part of the strategy is that you will be torn limb from limb and be able to reassemble yourself. So there are puzzles that involve ripping your own head off and chucking it at, at enemies or through uh, various puzzles. There are parts of boss fights where it's pretty much guaranteed that, yeah, you will be torn to bits. But you'll be okay as long as your head doesn't get eaten and you can reassemble yourself. Uh, otherwise, it's just kind of an interesting third-person action shooter with music primarily done by uh, 90s group Megadeth. Wow. Right? That's kind of interesting. It, it's definitely interesting. Uh, David Lodge handles the vo vocals for the main character. It, it's definitely worth checking out. I'm really interested in seeing where this is going. Uh, check out a trailer if you haven't seen it yet. Oh, I feel like if I was immortal, I would stay home rather than ripping off my own head to solve puzzles. No, he, he apparently goes into the demon He's hunting demon business. Hunter. So it, it's Devil May Cry with, like, a reward for screwing up. Anyway! Dante wouldn't live through having an arm ripped off. This guy gets his head ripped off and treats it like it's just Tuesday. Um, alright, moving on. We have Soul Calibur V. Because another hey, one. Uh, a fighting game is actually advancing its storyline? What? Like, this this game takes place 17 years after Soul Calibur 4. Now, during that time, you gotta think. Some of these characters, at least the ones who aren't immortal, are going to age and probably have to retire. And so, they've actually done that in the storyline. Um, the biggest example, Aki, is no longer in the game. Uh, she is being replaced by her apprentice. I'm trying to find her name right now. I know it's in here somewhere. And her Control move set F. is her move set and weapons are nearly identical to what Takis would be if she were in the game. Yeah, uh, they've had minor changes, but if you are a Taki player, you will be playing as this new character. Also, how is Ivy still in this then? Ivy is immortal. Oh. Yeah, Ivy was really old way back in the day. Yeah. She started uh, really old. Yeah, she's the... It's been a long, long time. I was a kid when I last played a Soul She's Calibur the daughter game. of Cervantes, and by approximation is just as immortal as he is. I haven't played a Soul Calibur game in years. Yup. So, yeah. I remember I played Talon Ta Taki has been replaced by uh, a female blonde ninja named Natsu, who actually has more personality than Taki ever did. Maybe that's why they cut her. <laughs> Which is to say, any whatsoever? Um, the other character that needed to be replaced for a while has been, uh, Sophitia. Okay. Because, you know, she was old and a mother when Soul Calibur 2 came out. 
But Sophia uh, is nearly redundant anyway, because she plays just like Cassandra. Who is also no longer in the game. No! <laughs> Sorry. I play Cassandra. Cassandra got a bit, bit too old, too. Um, yeah, they haven't said any. Actually, yeah, no, Cassandra's gone. Uh, so we've replaced both of those characters with uh, Pyra, who is actually Sophitia's daughter. Who was kidnapped by Tira, and then yeah. apparently raised without uh, knowledge of her family. This is actually not a plot point that was pulled up all of a sudden at 5. This was this was the reason Cassandra was in the game in 2, was because Sophitia had left to hunt for her daughter. Yep, and why both of them were in 3 and 4, because they apparently were really bad about finding this child. Um, Tira who was added in Soul Calibur 4, returns, and is actually more of an independent character this time, rather than just Nightmare's apprentice. So, seeing as she has not accepted that the new Nightmare is her master, she's actually on her own now and developing her character. Um, Raphael is apparently uh, back again, refusing to retire. Uh, Yoshimitsu, some might remember from Tekken, <laughs> Yes. Is coming back. Um, our, our super special guest character this time, I actually agree with more so than the last group. Because if you remember Soul Calibur 4, what were, who were the guest characters in Soul Calibur 4? Uh, Darth Vader and Yoda? Darth Vader, Yoda, and the Sith Apprentice from Star oh, Wars Unleashed. Unleashed. Yeah, those didn't make much sense, and were kind of overpowered, because they had force powers in a hand-to-hand -hand fighting, or in a uh, weapons fighting game. Mm -hmm. This time, we have Ezio Auditore de Firenze. Oh, For wow. Ezio will be joining the cast of Soul Calibur as the new addition character, which is great, because he actually fits the time period. We're not, like, pulling weird characters out of space and time. Just, Ezio, he could exist in this world. I'm excited about that. I, other than the fact that I like the uh, Assassin's Creed franchise for reasons that I'm not entirely clear on myself, Ezio has really interesting animation cycles. As a character, yeah. he's got lots of fabric, and he moves around in interesting ways. So, I'm sure there will be interesting animations to look at. Oh yeah, he fights with all of his weapons, uh, including his crossbow. Uh, he uses smoke grenades, that kind of thing. It, it's actually really cool. Does he use the call-in apprentices where the, the just different assassin comes out from behind you and kills you? Uh, no, he doesn't call in other assassins. Although he will pop smoke and then rogue you in the back. Um, overall, this is shaping up to be a really cool fighting game. Uh, they have said that they spent a ton of time with the create a character system. Uh, trying to even add more detail than was in Soul Calibur 4, which is always really the highlight of Soul Calibur games, from my opinion. Just being able to design your own character, equip them, and then pick their fighting style. Plus, uh, you'll actually be able to customize their moves this time. Sounds interesting. I actually, yep. let, I, the only game in the series I played was Soul Calibur 2, and I played a lot of that, but that was before the character creation system was introduced. So I, I've, yeah. I've had about 10 to 15 minutes with the character creator in 4, and it seemed interesting, but not flexible enough to do the things that I might want to do. And so a better version of that could be really awesome. Yep. I, I was impressed with the character creation in Soul Calibur 4, so if they're just increasing it in Soul Calibur 5, I really want to see it. Oh, actually, uh, you were commenting that you wanted someone who played like Cassandra. Uh, actually, the... Uh, Sophitia's son, who is the main character of this iteration of the game, is actually the protagonist. Um, he is going to play similar to Cassandra. Yep. He will be the one who I plays like Cassandra. Trying to pronounce no. That. And Pira is the... I'm looking at this term that they use, but she's the anti-hero for the game. Does she play, play like Bobo? Like no, Voldo is actually back in the game. Voldo apparently could not retire over 17 years. And even Siegfried's back, because he's apparently immortal now. I, I'm not sure that I wanted somebody who played like Cassandra so much as I wanted actual Cassandra. 
Uh, no, both of the sisters have retired. Although I'm willing to bet they'll come in as, like, unlockable characters. I don't know that I was actually attached to the mechanics so much as the character model, but I think Ezio could win me over. Although I assume there's not going to be a PC version of this. I would assume not. That I is lame. This, really quick. this yeah, is a game no. that I would probably buy on PC, but will PS3, not buy on Xbox consoles. 360. Alright, so continuing. Uh, February is actually the huge month for gaming, because if you remember correctly, all those games that were supposed to come out at the end of this year got moved to February of next year? Or last this year? year? Yes, that time. So, up first, we've got The Darkness 2. Which I will say was probably one of the most interesting first-person shooters of, what, three years ago? That completely passed me by. I didn't know there it's was a, a game first called The Darkness. It's a first-person shooter based on the Image comic book. Uh, you play as Jackie Esperito, a mafia hitman turned mob boss, who has the power of pure demonic darkness to back up his abilities. I have a powerful urge to fire a magic missile at this game. Um, so, nice. So at any point where you have shot out the lights in a room, you have access to your darkness powers. These include hellish tentacles that can destroy your enemies, um, imps that will come out of the shadows and destroy whoever's in your way, uh, possibly take fire from you. Reminds it, me of fear. Do you get to possess it, your opponents? That wasn't a power in the original game. What you could do is sick an imp on people and it would jump on their back and kind of point their gun where it wanted it to fire. Good enough. It, it's a very interesting first-person shooter, and the only complaint I had about the uh, the previous version was that it had a lot of filler built into it. But if they've got more actual substance to the game, I, I really look forward to it. I must say I've broadened my it horizons. It features a new tactic called quad-wheeling. Yes. In which you have the tentacles firing as well. He's got two darkness tentacles coming out of his back that can use weapons as well. Because having two guns at one point isn't ridiculous enough, we want four. Basically. Yep. Alright, so continuing down the list, um... We're going to stick to games that haven't been previously released because we've got a couple that are Ultimate Edition releases of previously released games. Um, Although, Resident and I Evil... don't know if you have this on your list, but I am going to make you talk about Super Monday Night Combat when later in the year. Okay. All right, just let me know when uh, when that's coming up. we got to get through February. So, continuing. Um, Resident Evil Revelations might prove that there's actually games on the 3DS. So this is the action-oriented version of Resident Evil that I know some people are really looking forward to. I was confused by your stating the title of this game because that I got to the colon and revelations and I was like, wait, Assassin's Creed? Nope. Resident I... Evil apparently has revelations to do as well. There must be it's like some severe shortage of subtitles yeah. going on. Which means on, that cause... my game gets a g my uh, console gets a game. <gasps> yup. So, of course, we're playing as Chris Redfield, because why have any other protagonist? But we also have a new character, Jessica, who we don't know anything about. So, yeah, once again, they're hunting bioorganic weapons, zombies. Working for the BSAA, which is a horribly acronymed organization. Bad, stupid, awful... I was thinking bullshit Alcoholics Anonymous. I was looking for a way to make organization tag. out of A, but... Oh, well, I heard we the explicit tag earlier. well and truly. Alright! I think there was a fuck and a shit back in... Back in the Underworld back Review. Back in the movie review, you weren't even paying attention! I was trying to get my headphones working, so I didn't hear them. I would have worked All the tits in there if I could have, but it didn't occur to me. <laughs> Alright, so continuing. Um, I know I said no continuations, but... Frankly, the creators of this game just don't know how to name their games new things, so this is technically a sequel. Blaze Blue, continue and shift, extend. <laughs> I really think 
Arc System Works just doesn't know how to name their games. I like how emphatically Maybe that title informs last... you that this is a continuation of the previous game. Because... Right, but it's still a sequel, because you're adding new characters and revising the fighting system. It was originally called Blaze Blue Continuum Shift 2 Plus. <laughs> no, that was actually a new version. Oh, wait, this one? Original yeah, this... Title. The, the new version was Continuum Shift 2 Plus, but now it's Continuum Shift Extend because that's less phallic. Somehow. <laughs> Alright, continuing down the list. Um. Did it, did it, did it, twisted Metal, because we're going to ignore that numbers exist to tell us what version of a game it is. But I assume the console that it's on tells you that. Yeah, but it's the new Twisted Metal, and hey, it's being made by the people who made the original Twisted Metal. So yeah, I'm, I'm totally on board with this. That was announced, what, two E3s ago, I think? Yep. That was that was the announcement, but of course, E3s, when, when it appears at E3 and when it actually comes out, are in no way correlated. Is this a high-def remake of the original? No, it is an entirely new version of the game. Is it keeping the old continuity, or is it a complete reboot? It is uh, keeping the continuity. Huh? Well, that's interesting. So we, we actually Did Calypso are die at some point? Calypso has died in multiple endings, just not in any that actually Let's see. affect Synopsis the game. Is... Game will stick to its original plot, contestants trying to win Calypso's tournament. Uh, game will only feature a small amount of characters to play. Yeah, they're, they're not going to overload us with characters, and I like that fact. Um, but yeah, just. Just sticking with the idea, we don't need... I don't think you really need canon for Twisted Metal, to be honest. I mean, it's always cool to see the characters ending, but the, the general story is that dudes are just shooting each other in cars. Right? Yep. And then there's, you know, ancient Greek irony that you are horribly defeated because of your hubris at the end. Oh yeah, most of the characters suffer from that. Although, and, like, well, uh, Dolphin's got a good ending in the last and partially Calypso is a dick. Yeah. You have to be careful what you wish for, because Calypso is very literal. Well, he's not right. even he's not even just literal in the way that the ancient Greek prophecies were. He's actively a dick. Like, there's no amount of precision that could circumvent Calypso screwing you over. And he would even do he would contradict the exact wording of your wish to torture you at some points. He, I, he there tried are to give that Sweet Tooth that. what he wanted. I what remember was that? the end the ending of Twisted Metal Black, like Sweet Tooth's wish, wish was, I want my head to not be on fire. And Calypso's like, well, I can't undo the curse that's on you, but what I can do is I can uh, get it to go away as long as you stop killing people. Of course, Sweet Tooth was like, no. <laughs> well, see, the other thing I expect Calypso, Calypso to do is just remove his head, such that he didn't have a head. And right. You don't have a head, and it's not on fire. Ooh. <laughs> you win! Alright, continuing. Uh, Azura's Wrath. Which is like, someone sat down and went, you know, God of War isn't angry enough. We need to go beyond that. So what you have here is an Eastern mythology character who has four arms in like this pseudo-mythological sci-fi setting who gets so angry during fights that like, he punches things until uh, his four arms break off and he is just left headbutting the enemy. Sounds like he's pretty angry. At, at one point, you fight bosses that are larger than the planet, and you do not change in size. It, watch the trailers for this game, because you will see insanity along the lines of which you have never seen before. It, it is truly interesting. Who forgot to turn the phone off? <laughs> yeah. Are any of your enemies Galactus? Uh, larger than Galactus. That's pretty big. Galactus has limits. These guys apparently don't. So, like, expect a just utterly insane third-person fighting game out of this. You're gonna fight some enemy that's, like, 32 astronomical units tall. Right. Um, I am noticing a whole bunch of PS Vita titles coming out in February. Because the PS Vita is launching in February. I'm going to avoid talking about the Vita. I just want to point out that there's a title on here called Touch My Katamari. <laughs> <laughs> I've actually seen the trailer for that. <laughs> it involves the king of all cosmos being super distressed about not being cool enough, as everything must. 
All right, then. Yeah, I'm gonna avoid talking about the Vita, because we haven't confirmed enough about it, and frankly, I haven't touched one of the things yet, so it doesn't exist as far as I'm concerned, until I see it. But moving on, we have March, and March is a huge month for games. You know why? Mass Effect 3? Yeah! The Mass trilogy's over! Right? What more needs to be said? That's like all of March right there. That's um, it. Then there's the Silent Hill HD collection, then there's the Sims 3 Showtime, there's a new Sims 3 X-Pack coming out. And the Sims 3 X-Pack featuring... Katy Perry. Yup! I, I watched the trailer for this, there's like... There's a collector's edition sc scroll down sponsored and by Katy Perry. Please tell me they have the trailer on here. Okay, no, you need to go to GameSpot right now and oh, watch the trailer to this thing. Oh, there it is. Perfect, Amazon Video. You're going to watch the trailer to this, and we're going to get capture on film the horror that appears on your face of <laughs> Katy Perry animated entirely in The Sims 3. So you have fun with that. I'm going to continue down the list. Um, also in March, same day... Wait, you don't want me to comment on this? <laughs> oh no, you can interrupt me and comment. No, it's fine. But continuing down the list, we have Street Fighter Cross Tekken, which is really just shaping up to be cooler and cooler. Um, we have new characters added all the time, and the fighting system is actually unique. So this might be a game really worth seeing, because Lord knows Tekken Cross Street Fighter is just going to be Tekken with Street Fighter characters added to it. Whereas Capcom went actually out of their way to completely make a new game. Look, it's Katy Perry, the Sim. She looks about the same. Alright, continuing. Eating each other. Katy Perry is always eating people. It's how she nourishes <laughs> herself and gains strength. True story. Katy Perry is a dishad. Right. Also, I find it very scary to think that her outfits are going to be in the Sims. Because right now she looks like a fruit salad. Mmm, fruit salad. Katy Perry fruit salad? See? You saw that, right? Yeah, no. Sims who are making out do not actually look like they're making out. They look like they're trying to eat each other's face. Oh, dead Sim. Nope, it's not dead. Now dead. he's dead. All right, continuing. So, we have uh, Armored Core 5. Because people still play that franchise? No, now think of the horribleness. All of that stuff, the giant banana sculpture, is going to be in The Sims 3. You're going to be able to make that weird candy dance-off land. I don't know what Katy Perry's deal is with the fruit motif, but it's getting a little weird. <laughs> uh, wait, it wasn't getting weird when she was shooting whipped cream out of her tits? You know, this woman might have a food fetish. I'm glad that we finally got to a sincere tits, and not my forced one like earlier. I, I did that just for you, you know. So there you go. You have watched the trailer for Katy Perry's The Sims Showtime. Does your brain hurt yet? Oh my god, her eyes are the- Yeah, they, they made the character's eyes enormous. I would totally play Armored Core if I could be promised a hex grid. Any giant That's mech fighting game on a hex insane. grid is, is something totally that I could play. I would totally play Armored Core 5 if I could annihilate Carrie. Also, this Perry isn't on Earth your- Kingdom. this isn't on your wiki list here? It is. Silent Ah. It is definitely on my okay, list. Okay, so it's just further down. Okay. Silent Hill Downpour, which is a remake of the Silent Hill that was on the PSP. I believe. Someone can correct me if I'm wrong on that. Da, da, da. The story of Murphy Pendleton. I don't know, I didn't play... I don't have a PSP, so... <laughs> I have a PSP, no, and no, it, it's a completely, never used it for anything. It's a completely original story, but here's a question to ask, listeners. You can chime in on this if you want. Um, when was the last time a Silent Hill game was good? We could find out. Depends what you mean by good. If Playable by good you mean had a very low draw distance. That was any of them. Because, like, the only one I remember specifically enjoying was uh, Silent Hill 1 and 2. I think everything after that was pretty much garbage. My impression of these games is not that you're supposed to enjoy them. It's supposed to, that you're supposed to feel bad. 
That's how <laughs> I feel it in regards to them. Silent Hill makes you analyze yourself and then feel bad. Makes you feel bad about yourself, even. All right. So, continuing. Ah, uh, Super Monday Night Combat. It's okay. like League of Legends, if League of Legends was a first-person shooter. This is, is kind of sweet. A derivative of Monday Night Combat, which was a first-person shooter that was sort of this and very similar to uh, Team Fortress 2. And the developers of that game wanted to make a MOBA, a, a Dota-type game, out of it while retaining the fact that it was a Team Fortress 2-style first-person shooter. And then they did it. It's in closed beta right now, and... Hey guys, can we stop texting me and reminding me that my phone is still on? <laughs> the, the three of us right. have private invites to the closed beta, so we'll be playing that before it comes out. It's still under and embargo, we won't be so we can't actually talk about oh, it yet. We won't but, be discussing it. But when, when, we, when it does come out from embargo, which might be when it comes out or it might be before, then we will be reviewing it. All right. So, that was the thing I was trying to tell you about. We also have coming out in March another game that might make people actually play the 3DS. Yeah. Kid Icarus. Ah, Uprising. Uprising. Yep, it's a thing. Also coming in March, because why not? It's worth a laugh. Ninja Gaiden 3. That's right, they're making one without Itagaki. Maybe this time the females won't be clothed in... Well, things that would be considered inappropriate in a uh, burlesque house. Okay. Maybe. Trust me, look at some of the character outfits from uh, Ninja Gaiden 3 and tell me those people work for the CIA. Okay. Or sorry, Ninja Gaiden 2, because it's a little ridiculous. Yeah, look look that up, Pix. Your, your brain's going to hurt. So Ninja Gaiden 2, Gaiden females. Two. All right, continuing down the list while she has a conniption fit. <laughs> um, God, only, I thought only Nolf Dog said that. We have... Are these our protagonists? <laughs> um, yup. That's not even the, the, like, new one that was introduced. Those are the old ones. But yeah, of, of course, Ayane, uh, Ayane is there. And... Yeah. Continuing. Um, so, Operation... I forget what it was called, Rainfall? Was actually successful. Amazing. And the, the Wii will be getting a release in April. That's right, Xenoblade Chronicles. Only almost a year after it came out in the other countries, you know, in the same language. Finally, we owners will be able to say... In North America. We have a game. Alright, we're only going to cover quarter one, because, frankly, everything else doesn't quite well, have a release date yet. Quarter two, technically. I know, but I had to talk about it, because it's a really big deal that Nintendo caved to gamers making petitions. And campaigns to say, hey, we'll, we'll buy this game. The, the real fun irony is when they don't and just pirate it. And so it, there's... Sorry, you go ahead. It's not coming out until the middle of the year? Yep. Quarter what do two. they have yep. to do? It's all... They have to print new stickers that say, hey, you bought this? They can't just be like, here, have it. Right. Um, the one other announcement for quarter one that I want to bring up that's still speculated... Um, Diablo 3 is supposed to be out sometime in the first three months of this year. Diablo but 3 is supposed to come out this. whenever Blizzard feels like it. Yeah, whenever, whenever Blizzard, Blizzard is not presses accountable the button. to any force of man or nature. At this point, they have their own gold reserve in their basement, so no, they're not. Um, there, there's a few other big titles that don't have actual release dates yet. Not that any of them are more reliable than anything else. I, I, Bioshock Infinite still doesn't have a release date. It's supposed to come out sometime this year. Darksiders 2. Another Fable game. Dota 2. Uh, it is, DMC. of course, possible that any of these could pull a Trine 2 and be like, yeah, we're going to release tomorrow, and then they release tomorrow. I really would like some of these, too. I would be... Yes, Paper Mario? I would be really thrilled if, uh, if Blizzard was just like... Post the night before on their website. Yep, get your Diablo 3 now. It's like, it's done. Come get it. They could dominate a news cycle pretty easily. Pretty easily. Yeah. Um, so. Where the heck is Lollipop Chainsaw on here? Not announced. Yeah. I'm sorry, I don't think it actually has a release date yet. Well, it's not on the, uh, 
announced for this year either. Yeah, you could try looking it up on the Lollipop Chainsaw page. Maybe it just missed this one. Yeah, well, I looked at its wiki and it just said TBA sometime in 2012. But... Yeah, they probably just don't have a release date yet. All right, so continuing, we've got big news in League of Legends that we're going to talk about for the rest of the show. So if you've been patiently waiting for League news, here's your reward. And if you were tempted by my promise of productivity secrets at the beginning, you'll have to wait till next show, because we're running out of time. Yep. League of Legends. So, uh, on top of our usual announcements of various champion sales and skin sales, this week saw the rather enormous announcement of the Rise of the Bot Army patch that will be coming. So if you haven't seen this yet, head over to the, uh, the Riot Games webpage, leagueoflegends.com, to see the full notes on this. They even did a rather impressive write-up for just what this entails. Uh, let's see, view all information. Here we go. So Does it even got... more robot AIs for playing yes. against the computer? Yes. More nice. new, revised, new modes, all of it. Uh, better progression through the game. Riot went back and went, you know, the group of people that we've really overlooked in this game are the people who just want to sit back and play against bots with either uh, other other players or with friends. Uh, they still, I don't know if they've added a, a mode where just you can play with the bot or with a team of bots. You can still do that. You can do it, but it doesn't work very well. Yeah. Because no, the bots doesn't. are kind of dumb against the bots. Yeah. No, it's incredibly hard. They don't. They don't accomplish anything. So here we go. We have. 28 new bots being added to the existing lineup. That's a large number. Yes. So, in addition to the bots that we know and love, we're going to have Malphite, Graves, Shivana, Lux. You don't have enough fingers to count all the I know that. <laughs> um, Garen, Cassiopeia, uh, Kale, Fiddlesticks, uh, Zin Li, or Zin Zhao, Galio. Tristana, Malzahar, Brand, Udir, Leona, uh, Zillion. Morgana. Yep, Morgana's going to be a bot. Jax. Jax, Amumu, Kogma, Wukong, Caitlyn, Swain, Irelia, uh, Sona, Ramus, Sivir, and Karthus. All added as bots with brand new AI. They're scrapping the entire current AI for the characters to provide better bots that so will react... So we will have 40 total AI bots yep. to play against. So, that... these better bots, does that mean they will cheat less? Like, not have unreasonable respawn times? Nope, they're, they're going to be centered on the exact same skills that you have. Uh, they're going to use their summon, summoner abilities more, and actually make use of activatable items. So, say that that Garen that you're playing against buys the, uh, the Mazamune, you better believe he's going to trigger that, giving him an increased 50% movement speed, or 20% uh, movement speed, and 50% attack speed. Alright, the new bots will perform more intelligently than their predecessors. Yeah, so this is that thing that a lot of people notice where if you knock a bot down to 20% health regardless of what it's doing, it will run away. Even if it's about to kill yeah, you. Yeah, even if you're at, like, 2% health. Or if, yeah, even if it's on the inside of a turret. Yeah, the new bots aren't going to do that. The new bots will behave like real players. Where it's if possibly. they think they can kill you, they will. They will make better use of their summoner spells. They will make better decisions as far as to how to equip their characters, and will have incredible map awareness and team coordination. I'm kind of afraid of this. The bots will be able to deploy skill shots. Yeah, it's going to be crazy. Um, they're also, and this is a really big deal because this is something I've wanted for a long time, they're going to enable bot matches for Dominion. So if you want to play that cool new mode that was added to the game months ago, that, you know, your options are, we'll jump in with live people and probably suck or don't play it at all, you'll finally be able to experiment with that against bots that are actually smart enough to go for the various power-ups that are around the map. So I'm sort of intrigued by the idea, and this isn't inspired by anything in the patch, but they should have a team of bots that plays on ladder all the time and just is ranked on ladder like any other human and see where they shake out. Actually, if you watch the video of how they tested the bots, they, they have video of... 
that they show when they're discussing the new bots of specifically bots playing against bots and doing some really intelligent maneuvers that you could pass off as, as human play. The only thing that gives it away is that when you get a kill, it'll or when a kill comes up, it'll say, uh, like, any bot just killed Warwick bot. But that's how they tested and rated these bots, just having them play each other. But having them play each other is not nearly as interesting as just putting them on ladder against humans. That actually sounds like a really cool idea. I want to see Riot try that, and, and just publicly post the rankings of Team Bot. Yeah, and you can just, they'll, they'll play like 20 matches a day, or maybe 100 matches a day, but, and then you can just see how they go up and down the rankings. I actually think that's really cool. Uh, part of the goal of this patch was to make it so that the bots aren't as predictable as they normally are, because let's face it, once you learn how the bots play in League of Legends, they'll always do that. The old I bots, can, if they were put on ladder, Annie. would lose horrifically. They would be in Wood League all the time. Yeah, I, I mean, if, if I'm playing against any bot mid, I know exactly what percent health she's going to run away at. I know exactly what she's going to do with any given move at any time. The point of the new patch is to make it less predictable. Make it so that you don't always know what this bot is going to do, how it's going to attack you. Um, also, just having 40 available options gives the game literally thousands of different combinations that you could end up playing against in any game, where these days with only 12, you know pretty well who you're going to end up against just by clicking that co-op versus AI button. The other thing I would like to see, and I also don't see this in the patch notes, but that would be a larger selection of difficulties, because... As, as of right now, there's only beginner mode and intermediate mode. Where and beginner mode is pretty much, yeah, they're, they're just going to walk at you, and you will be able to do your moves and kill them. And you can hardly mode, lose against beginner bots. Intermediate mode is really hard until you learn the bot AI, at which point it becomes stupidly easy. And just from a linguistic perspective, intermediate means in the middle, which sort of and implies that there should you, be one above it. Yeah, you can't have... A medium without a large and a small to base it on, remember? That's, That's what the sparks. word intermediate means. It means that it's between two things. Yep. So yeah, th this just has me really excited because part of the way I relax playing League of Legends is just getting in a bot game. You know, because I don't have to deal with the stress of, of live people on the other team. Having more things to play against and choose from, that's going to keep players from getting bored if they don't want to jump in right away and start playing live matches. Because let's face it, I wouldn't want to play against live opponents until I had Flash at level 12. That's a long time to wait to just play the same bots over and over again. So, while I'm brainstorming, I actually have another idea for a League of Legends feature enhancement. One of uh, my biggest deterrents against playing this sort of game is that I never know if some real-life concern is going to inspire me to need to leave the computer. Which, yeah. there should be like a queue such that you can just DC from a match, and then somebody who is sitting in the queue can just pop into your character right where you were and take over your champion. And just right in the middle of the game, seamlessly. I would actually really hope that if the new bots are good enough, that a feature is added where if a person disconnects and is gone for, say, a minute, a have bot a bot play. take over. Yeah. If it's one of the bot characters, why not just have the bot run the character, then? Create also a, a good idea. AI for the character. I, I like both of those things. I, I like not needing human to do it, but I also like the idea that I could be like, well, I'm just going to pop open League of Legends and jump in the replacement queue, and then I'm going to be thrown into a match that's already 15 minutes in. Yeah, actually, yeah, finish I, really, it off. I really like that idea, because that's a lot better than punishing the four people on your team who decided not to AFK just because a game wasn't going well. And who knows, the new person that got added might make the team. Ah, I, I think the replacement queue idea is a good one. That might be something to suggest for, uh, for Riot. Actually, a really good idea. I am brilliant. Brilliant. Yeah, I, I really want to see like some of the horrible combinations that could come out of these new characters. Like, the, the utter insanity of a... Shenbot and Gravesbot lane would just Ow. kill people. Um, I'm, I'm nervous about that, Caitlyn. <laughs> I, I want to see the non-idiotic Renekton. Because the Renekton bot is so dumb right now. He is just free kills all day long. 
So is there no new champion this week? Uh, well, we've had an announcement of a, a preview announcement for the next new champion. And I just a moment. Uh, so far, Sejani is the newest champion. And from the look of things, she is finding a spot in the jungle role in the game where it's pretty much impossible to escape from her. Okay, so our champion sneak peek that launched uh, last night is for a new character called Ziggs. Because let's face it, the game doesn't have enough Yordies. They're so cute. So we're getting Ziggs, the Hexplosives expert. For those people who thought, you know, Heimerdinger just doesn't cause enough explosions. We now have a Yordi who is centrally designed around explosions. I can't complain you about mean that. Between Heimerdinger and Tristana? Who also makes things explode. What is with Yordis and explosions? Especially when Rumble What's dies. with you and not explosions? I suppose. You racist against explosions, just sin. So right now all we've got is a single image of Ziggs drawing what could only be described as a bomb with another bomb. It's it's a it's little a bomb Matryoshka with a, doll of it's bombs. It's a bomb with a bomb in it. And a skull. And apparently a three second timer. So, the, no question, this character is going to be probably an AP champ. Um, armed with explosives, he'll have AoE effects. I don't know, I'm, I'm kind of intrigued. He, given what some of the bombs do, he might even be uh, fill a support role. Support explosions, but support. Explosions are the best type of support, as any the, underwear manufacturer the one will feature, tell you. The one feature that I really want to see added with this guy, I want him to have a bomb that he drops on the ground, and then when it goes off, it propels the enemy champion directly away from it a certain distance. Because you could do so much with that. Or, yeah, even just a repulsion bomb that it does it even damage you, but you could push yourself with it. That could be interesting. Well, they actually don't have any self-damaging uh, mechanics in the game. There's actually nothing that you can do that will hurt a member of your team. Uh, so, for that to exist, it would probably be an, a bomb that could propel you. Well, yeah, that's what I said. But it wouldn't damage you. That, that is what I said. Okay. Yeah, there, there's no self-harming mechanics in the game. There are characters that can use their health bar to do damage to themselves, or to do damage to do moves, but otherwise you can't, like, drop an AoE on one of your teammates and, and hurt them in any way, because that would just open up so many lanes of griefing. So yeah, that that's the newest champion. He'll probably be out either next week or the week after. Uh, next week is also free week for Sejani, for anyone who is looking forward to playing her. Because, you know, sometimes you need to play as a leather bikini-clad woman riding a Pig. Yeah. Riding a giant pig. Ride the pig. Hey, and with that, we're out of time. She ganks like a boss. So yeah, this has been it for Nerd Talk for this fine January 25th, 2012. I'm Pixie. I'm Sen. And I'm Pyrosin. And we'll see you next week on Nerd Talk.